Thomas, your theme tonight was um, hyperphysical, and you talked about the digital era. My career is embedded in the digital. Yours is very much embedded in, in the physical. Your projects have a kind of uh, solidity and a heaviness to them. Do you think, in a way, your by work... The, by the way, everybody, uh, we've known each other for a very long time, and um, Marcus and I went and had a sort of drink together. Um, how many years ago was it? Ten? Thirteen. Thirteen years ago, and Marcus said, I'm thinking of leaving the magazine where I work, and, and I'm thinking of, um, well, I'm thinking of setting up a website where we would show design. And uh, he, the thing is, he'd done this amazing uh, icon magazine that you, that you led, was so, so good, and I said, Marcus, I don't think it'll work. You know, I really think you should do, you do a new kind of physical magazine. And then he set up his website, and it's the most successful design website in the world, and uh, so I'm totally wrong. I tell that story all the time. Your, your, actual, your actual line, Thomas's actual line was, Marcus, who wants to read about architecture and design on the internet? <laughs> well, actually, everyone. <laughs> anyway, back to the, my question. Do you think, in a way, your work is a kind of reaction against the digital world? Do you think you're sort of, you're trying to compensate for the fact that people are migrating to the digital world by giving them kind of like a, a hyper-physical experience that is, that is maybe more solid and more in their faces than they might have had otherwise? No, no, because I was just amazed at how, how it felt we'd gone backwards. The buildings that seemed to have been built, you know, the, the disaster of the Second World War and then the amazing efficiency of what was possible to build after the war, not including the amazing museums that were getting built and signature incredible houses, the large v volume of what was being built, just astonished. I was just a little boy walking around thinking, why is it so rubbish? Why is that so rubbish? That, um, that all the modern designers and architects, we all live in the old houses in London and design new things, but live in the old ones and enjoy that. And it seemed that why had we lost that sensibility and sensitivity? And all, it, all I really meant was the digital revolution just turbocharged what it felt needed to happen anyways. We'd forgotten that a street is an emotional thing and where you live, how you feel in that, it's not successful housing unless it engenders feelings that um, make you feel secure, connect you with your your fellow humans and uh, sort of inspire you to to be what we are which is social when we want to and private and so in a sense it's not it, um, this is not anti-digital at all it's just brilliant great good news that it means that um kind of cynical shittiness can because doesn't need to happen so i'm not supposed to swear am i that wasn't really swearing <laughs> okay it's very polite English swearing. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk about uh, emotion as a function, and I guess in the digital era, era a lot of our physical um, interaction with the world is just pushing a finger across a, a piece of glass. But tell us how you create emotion through tactility. Through d Do you encourage people to touch your buildings? Uh, of course, people walk in, they see them. Um, how, are th how else do you touch people's senses beyond just the visual? When I was little, um, my my mum had a shop, a jewellery shop, with these huge baskets of beads. And uh, all these baskets had signs on saying, please touch. And that, at that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, was that felt not what was happening around. And so in the buildings we're working on, we're trying not to tell people what they're supposed to do, but we're just making platforms for that we hope are we prioritize projects that are publicly accessible and, and are interested in the human-centered dimension. It just felt that the design of placemaking was often led from a cerebral logic of concepts for places rather than being led by how someone will experience them. And so we're, we're trying to juggle all of those things and, and also the sustainability now. We're more interested than ever in that, but that's been for the last couple of decades been led as a data-led sustainability analysis rather than a human-centered. And so we've been, in a way, we're, we're trying to learn and develop in our projects how to, what we hope is make projects that will be as valuable to us as possible in human terms. 
What is your process? Is your process very, very hands-on, or do you immediately pick up your computer mouse or your touch your iPad? How do you, how do you express your ideas? How do you work in the studio? Well, I don't, they're not my ideas. Um, we work as a team. When I studied and did my master's degree, you'd sit there and there were all the other students, and they'd, we'd all got into the Royal College of Art, and everyone sort of thought, I got into the Royal College of Art, I must be really good. And then they sat there trying to be brilliant by themselves. So I sat there at college thinking there was something wrong with me, that I wasn't just sitting there being brilliant. But there was an engineer who had come in, and when he came in and you sat with him, suddenly it felt like the lights came on, flowers grew, and design wasn't happening in me, and it wasn't happening in him. And we'd forgotten who was the engineer and who was the, the designer, and it was between us. And I have a strong sense that design is between you and you're all prodding and pulling and squishing up that and growing that and nurturing it into into a real project yeah and, and i work and work with the different teams and go around have the great privilege of working with 200 brilliant people my job in a way is to try and pull us together and to try to the person who's not saying anything but has got a sort of frown to sort of say what do you think and normally that frown means something really useful and they might be someone who started last week. The biggest project in the studio has been the studio, trying to work out how to, how to do it. When it began, it was just me, and I, it was the most painful thing, developing projects. And now it's, it's a much more of a pleasure, because I have the illusion I'm sharing it with everybody, and that I'm not on my, on my own, because I never worked for anyone else. Um, I worked for a... Um, a, mail order, a company called Argos in Britain, which no one will have heard of here, and a cycle catalog, catalog thing, and then and my mum's shop, and then and then set up the studio. So I had no none of the systems that you learn by working with other people. So also with that CV, you probably wouldn't have been able to get a job. Anyway, exactly, anyway. exactly. I was unemployable. <laughs> so your background is in design rather than architecture. I mean, architecture architects have got a reputation for being you know, the master, the, 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 the creative genius. Do you think that's influenced what you're talking about? It sounds, when you talk about how ideas are developed, it sounds like the way the Italians design furniture. So the designer will go into the workshop, meet the technicians who know how the machines work and mm. understand the materials, mm. and sort of say, I want it to be sort of like that. And, and is, is that a similar process? Well, I think, I think architecture's in a much better place now. But it felt that uh, when, when I was studying and when I was a teenager and going to exhibitions, I would look and you'd go to an exhibition. It didn't make sense at all. All the drawings, the architectural drawings, were impenetrable. And they were the art, was these complex drawings. And, um, and when I was an external examiner on some of the courses, the, some, the, some of the professors would be setting a project for their students to make a house for in, on the moon, on the side of a crater, for a one-legged person without gravity. And you just think, the real world's really exciting. The potential in the real world just in front of us, just across the road there, is boundless. And we don't need to create weird, abstract, creative, other pr brief to engage with because the world's exciting enough, the real one. And so I think it was, it felt that uh, it, it is design. I see it all as design. You don't architect a building, you design it. So it's the same thing. To wind back to what I was asking you before about uh, how ideas uh, come about. So for example, in the Cape Town project, when you the discovery that you could cut those tubes and create a really interesting shape. Was that an abstract idea? Did you think, what happens if we cut the tubes? Or did you have some tubes and you started, you and your team started just sawing them up and it was a discovery made through craft, through tactility, through physical Well, the, the, a mix. I mean, when we started the studio, we made every project ourselves because no one would commission us to do anything. And, and it, if they did, it, the budget was so low, you couldn't, you, to make it be this something special, th there was no contractor who would conventionally do that. So we became, we were the contractor, so we made everything. So the first 10 years, we were intensive makers. We haven't been making things for more than 12, 13 years because we now work with brilliant makers. But the making that we were doing is so intensively, is it, you, can't un -get, you can't get that out of you. So I've spent thousands of hours just 
experimenting with materials, when I, both through college and when setting up the studio, and then your curiosity. And we even became a contractor. We had Heatherwick Studio Construction. We built nine university buildings in Wales, in the UK, because otherwise they wouldn't have happened. And um, the romance is, is the project at the end. The romance, the making it isn't, ah, oh, the making of it. I mean, making is amazing, but it's goal-oriented of how do you end up with something that can sit there for decades and mean something for the people who are going to uh, start their business there or um, live there. You've designed a shopping centre in London, which I think you've got some images of. Tell us how you approach that. Like, in order to get people to a shopping centre in the oh. centre of London, how do you design that space so that the, the emotion becomes part of the function so that they, they actually turn up to King's Cross? It's just next to the Google project, isn't it, pretty much? Um, I felt like people underestimated how smart all humans are. And so I think there was an arrogance in the world of designing places and buildings uh, that sort of, and I felt that the interesting thing is trying to, is that human, we spot cliche immediately and formulas and we can tell that a mile off. And when, once something is what you think it's going to be, you start shutting down and making more assumptions. Whereas when something isn't exactly what you thought, your senses are, are more open. I never thought that we would design shopping malls. You know, when I was at school, I didn't think, oh, shopping, that's what I really want to do. But then when you think, well, actually, that, there are very few parts of our life where there's an economic driver that might make something happen and where there's a truly public place where you can all go. There aren't so many places where, where you feel you can just go and watch life going by. And shopping, and we got excited by, actually, that, that when... Uh, shopping is done well, where you don't feel you... It, it's just an excuse to be together. And if somebody buys something, fine. But our interest isn't in the buying. It's in the bringing people together and making a place you'd want to go to. And we had an, a sort of apprenticeship with a project in Hong Kong from that. But that taught us lots of, <coughs> lots of lessons. And um, so our studio is the bottom right square block... And then that long thing is the Google headquarters. That's the 900 foot long one. And then the, the third lot, the pair of like Kit Kat fingers higher on the left was these two Victorian coal drop sheds. So they were long warehouse buildings and we were being asked to turn it into a new shopping heart for King's Cross. And the Eurostar train to Paris goes just, just from here. And the, the thing was that these buildings that were the length of St. Paul's Cathedral. But what we'd learned from our work in Hong Kong was there was the assumption, we, actually, we weren't asked to design the whole shopping here. We were asked to do two bridges. We were asked to do two exciting bridges connecting the um, viaduct level here. And our experience working on the other things we'd looked at was that that was the wrong answer. And that the challenge was, how do you make a heart? And that the, in a normal shopping environment in a sh cheesy shopping mall you might get 33 foot distance roughly between shop fronts as a distance because that's the distance where you can recognize someone's face who's walking along there um, but you could also see swimming trunks and think oh, I don't need swimming trunks but they'll think I'll have a look and but w the the distance in this project at the top of those Kit Kat fingers it's twice that, so it's about 66 foot, and at the bottom it's about 99 foot apart. So it's double wrong and triple wrong in terms of the just main physics of how to make a space. And if we then put kind of exciting bridges in between, you have a pause where you look and kind of go, ooh, and, and walk. And it felt to us actually what we needed was un uninteresting bridges, because our problem is to get someone to flow around and actually, the problem was that two floors in the main metropolitan city of shopping, when in, you go to Shanghai and you go to Hong Kong, you might have five floors, seven floors, that sleepy little London having these two, two floors, there wasn't enough energy, and particularly if it was split apart. So energy seemed to be the challenge. And so 
there were these two long roofs. The building needed entirely new roofs. And it also, so to, the, to what you were saying, the challenge was also cliche. We, we, it's now an absolute formula. You get your old, lovely Victorian building. You clean up the brick, you sandblast it, and then you put a glass extension onto it, which is quiet and just stepping back. And uh, the hero is the old building, even though that old building was built like an IKEA shed by the Victorians, who didn't, who just were bashing out thousands of these in the United Kingdom. And it felt that just that that's the formula that you expect someone to do. So it felt it's business logic. To, if you do what people expect, then they are less likely to want to go somewhere. So it felt like we've had so many projects that have done one kind of approach, that duplicating Covent Garden here was not the best way to actually complement Covent Garden and have people come here. So we needed to make new roofs on these two buildings. And, uh, and then we thought, what we, we felt that we needed more retail, actually, to create excitement and energy, and that the only way to do that was to add a third floor so could we add a third floor? But then when you think, how would you add a third floor when you've got these kind of skis? And also, uh, we're not experts at Feng Shui, and maybe someone here is, but it felt like two sticks, two kind of broken Kit Kat fingers. Where's the heart to that? It's sort of a pyong kind of thing, not a ha huh, holding you. And so how did we make a heart? when we wanted to keep it open and respect the old buildings. And so slamming a glass box across them, across the top to connect them together, felt it sort of broke that energy. So um, that's me sounding all mystical, but so we need a new roof. So we looked at whether we could grow that roof to make that third floor so that we would grow those two roofs. And we managed to get to the same quarry that had provided the original slate to provide the slate for the new roof and that, in turn, would make a heart. So if you're meeting your granny or your girlfriend, hopefully your granny isn't your girlfriend, <laughs> and then you meet them here. There's a sort of place that's the focus. And then simultaneously, that's making a different kind of a space as an opportunity uh, for uh, 20,000 square foot of new space with a different perspective on London. The top space opened just over a week ago. And uh, you can go up and just gather and meet um, most of our work here was restoration, a bit like with the Museum of Contemporary African Art in Cape Town. So we've we unwittingly become um, restoration experts. We felt that the best way we could respect the Victorian architecture was to do something. The Victorians were so ambitious, and it felt that if we always sort of sit back and sort of drop our shoulders and have the limp responses, it felt, the, what would the Victorians have done? They would have responded more strongly, it felt to us. We had a very defined developer budget. This was not a national project. And one thing we'd learned in Hong Kong was it, the funny thing is that people, us humans who haven't really changed in thousands of years, the human scale, the thing you touch, can stick in your brain as mo sometimes more than the thing that has had tens of millions of pounds spent on it. And so the elevators are standard elevators we could buy. Many of the details are very, very standard. but. We were thinking the one thing you touch is the elevator button, uh, and there are six cores. And so then thought, well, how could we make something that isn't just um, And so it was relatively inexpensive to cast lift buttons, and we made the molds in our studio. We wanted them to be things that will age over time. So, there's, so we go back to belly buttons. And so there's innies and there's outies, and they, over time, they will shine up, and uh, this there's one that protrudes right quite um, a lot, which reminds me of something I saw at Burning Man, and uh, things that go in. And we, it was interesting, the response was interesting in that it's people on Instagram, people were, and, and it confirmed that simplicity of human nature, which is that thing, what you can get close to can touch you just as much as the roof. So there were just as many pictures of lift buttons as there were of slate roofs connecting, creating um, 20,000 square foot of new space. So I'm getting signs that we're nearly out of time, but finally I have to ask you about um, another project of yours. It's been quite controversial, part of a, a very controversial development in New York called Hudson Yards. Mm -hmm. Briefly, tell us about that project, and also if you could address the criticism that's been aimed at the whole of Hudson Yards and of, of, of your, your vessel project. I know that's a long 
um, open question for you. Tell but, me um, what the criticism is. <laughs> I think that the criticism of Hudson Yards in general, which was not all done by you, Thomas, um, is that it's kind of a vacuous um, architecture. The, the glass buildings have not been received particularly well, and they've kind of shoehorned luxury shopping into a part of New York that was mm. starting to be regenerated by this amazing project called the High Line, which is very democratic. Some people perceive the, the shops there as elitist, but also because it's a kind of uh, slight architectural zoo between the, the tall glass buildings, the, the Diller and Scafidio and Renfro shared building, and then your vessel. That these, mm. these, these projects don't really talk to each other. And then uh, a criticism that's sometimes made of your work, that it, it is design that's scaled up to city level, and I think some people have, have, have latched onto that with the vessel, that it's like an object that's been sort of inflated to multi-story level and that it's not really for anything. That's a sum mm. summary of mm. other people's criticisms of, of Hudson Yard, mm. since you asked for okay, it. Okay, okay. And we'll end there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's been great talking to you, Thomas. It's been great being yeah. your friend for the last 20 years as no, well. It's great. It's a shame it had to end at this <laughs> in LA. Uh, Come all this way to end a friendship. <laughs> and in front of an audience, it's great. Um, no, well, I think we're in a in an. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot in there to talk about. Um, I mean, our, our passion in the studio is things that are publicly accessible, and one of the challenges is that governments, uh, city governments, are Increasingly, I've, Paris is a bit different. They've, they've got a mayor who's really driving development. But certainly in London, the central government doesn't seem to sort of be leading the development of pieces of city. So it gets left to property developers to, to create major pieces of city. I mean, this is, the, in, in a sense, I think King's Cross is the biggest transportation hub, one of the biggest transportation hubs in Europe. And that's been led by... Uh, a development group called Argent, and but but it, it hasn't been led by government, and it's the the developers have had to fight to get to create a public place because it was inaccessible to the public for many many years, and so uh, it's the economics to make somewhere work are are very interesting that's necessary, but uh, I think that it's possible to suspect the worst of the intentions of a property developer. But there are, and we've been lucky to work with a few, who, who are very well-intentioned. People talk about pops, and there's been the sort of outrage that you're not allowed to protest, and outrage that um, you're not allowed to uh, drink on the street. And uh, that makes good, simple headlines, but it's interesting when you then look closely at the surrounding uh, public space that is run by the local authority, where uh, we forget that there's, you're not allowed to protest on mo many parts of the um, local authority land. You're not allowed to drink on the streets. There are surveillance cameras. So I think it's, there is uh, a time, and we are, uh, with our projects, we try to get maximum porosity and public access that we possibly can and work with and try to encourage the property developers when we work with a property developer to make something as accessible as possible and for as many people as possible. Um, and so then if we jump to uh, New York and there was this space that was going to be as big as Trafalgar Square, but it was quite phenomenal. How do you make new space when there's no space? So they built over the rail lines, all these rail lines, which was where they would have built if London hadn't won the uh, 2012 Olympics. Um, if New York had won it, possibly the stadium was going to be built here. And because it wasn't that going to happen, there were mer various different uses. But it's a huge technical engineering, civil engineering challenge to build a, a, a city over working rail lines. And so there's, there's been a major swathe of city built splicing columns through while all these trains are still there being used as these yards. And so I think we shouldn't underestimate what it takes. It isn't, it isn't easy to do. And um, so then within that was this space. And originally what we were asked to, was to put a sculpture there. We were asked, we, a number of people all asked for proposals. And our response was to say that we didn't think that, it, it, we talk about, if I, I was talking earlier about cliche, the, the format that became very familiar in the last century of the plaza 
and the plaza sculpture. And I think they said the turd in the plaza. You know, there was there's a very simple plain buildings and then a wiggly thing sitting there in the corner. And, everyone, oh. and it felt, <laughs> we, we, we proposed, so there were, you know, it, we could see that, you know, there's the, the obvious thing. And our first conversations with the team developing this was, this is what we expect you to do. We expect you, you know, the phenomenal project in Chicago uh, at the Millennium Park there. And, um, you know, you expect an even more amazing mirror polish thing by the guy who does the amazing mirror polish things. That's what I expect someone to do. So you think, don't do what people expect you to do. Because that then just shows it's, it's a kind of rich world. And, and what, uh, rather than ideas led, and I mean, we weren't responsible for any of the buildings around, but what we could do and what we proposed was uh, something building on their heritage that the High Line, I mean, New York's a funny city, and, but it's innovated with the phenomenal Central Park, you know, major swathe of incredible nature sitting in heart of such density. And, and then suddenly there was the High Line that happened. And it, it's extraordinary because if someone said, well, we're gonna make piece of park that's about um, 20 foot wide, mile and a half long, and it's a bit of park, you would go, huh. but by lifting it up into the air, suddenly everyone gets a different perspective. And uh, so the, New York was innovating with public space, so we felt, why don't we build on that momentum? And also the Hudson River Park Trust, we, who have been doing the piers and that are Pier uh, 55 that we've been working on is part of. We felt a duty, could we, could we give something that everyone can use and touch? And you know, when you say, well, it's got no purpose, has it? Um, you then go, hmm, what's the purpose of Central Park? What's the purpose of the High Line? What's the purpose? The whole point of, rec of, of recreation space is what's precious is that it doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do. So it's, it's in a sense, it's a different form of, of um, public space that, that you can do what you want. But I remember when I first came to New York and seeing, I'd never seen uh, people in suits, but with sneakers on, power walking to work. <laughs> and like, oh, in my body's a temple. <laughs> you know, and it just felt like what, you know, and now it, it, that neurotic, New York neurotic, now we're all neurotic and everyone in London is as well and they go to the gym too. But it was interesting to see that relationship to the physical, it developed actually from looking at some of these step wells in India, in Rajasthan, and thinking about how could we make something that brought people together but didn't block a space so that it, you could look at each other as well as look out. So could we make a room and could we let you use your body to, to navigate that? And when we realized, you know, when did you last walk up 16 stories? So the, the, the project has 2,500 steps. So the, the emotional function of this is to tire people out, is it? Whatever you want to do. You don't have to walk to the top, but you, or you can use it as your workout. It has 80 public spaces on it, and it in itself is this room. And uh, interestingly, if you try to get someone to walk up 16 floors of a fire escape, the mental tiredness you'd have from that versus walking up 18 stories here, you're, you're halfway up before you... Um, uh, uh, have realized your legs are actually tired. So it was such a relief for people to finally get inside it because it wasn't about the object from the outside. It was about the object from the inside. We wanted to make a social device. And the whole point is for it to not be a building. And how incredible that a client, a development client, said yes to this. And I think it's, it's, great. it's fine to not like it. But the thing I think that should be appreciated is the ambition of people to say yes to, to making ideas really happen. We never expected anyone to say yes. And Americans are known for exaggerating, I'm sorry. But so when we presented this, the team went, I love it. And we just thought, you just think this is all right. And it took a number of presentations till actually finally we believed it. And so the, uh, the evidence of something that really exists, we're looking at, 800 people on it um, at any one time. And uh, it's, in a sense, that we valued in history. There were places that engaged us. And I think it, it's got values that, you know, of trying to connect with 
curiosity, humour, all of the things that I think matter to things that matter to people. And talking about the emotional function of it, when I went there, I saw the length of the queue. I asked someone how long it would take to get on it, and they said, Ugh, come back tomorrow. So my emotional, the, the emotional function it triggered in me was disappointment, actually. It's definitely a very popular project. But that's because you're lazy and you can get a ticket online and walk straight in. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a sense of entitlement, Mr. Fares. <laughs> and, uh, you I also know the designer. I should have just called him up and say, Thomas, <laughs> yes. get me in. <laughs> Look, we've got, to, we've got to finish up now. We're way over time. But Thomas, has been absolutely fascinating. Your, your work has, has triggered emotional responses with people all around the world. It's, it's definitely loved by people, if not so much by certain critics. It's been fantastic talking with you. And thank you all so much for, for coming and listening. <laughs> <laughs>